light and shadows are stranger than you might think. In the 1800s, when people were first trying to come to grips um, with a, a realistic theory of light, uh, the French Academy held a huge competition for people to submit their ideas. Was light a wave or a particle? So a scientist named Fresnel submitted his theory that said light was a wave. But another scientist in the committee, Poisson, was not a fan of the wave theory of light. And he wanted to prove Fresnel's theory wrong using only its own arguments. And he found a ridiculous conclusion, that if you shine a light on a perfectly spherical object, in the middle of its shadow, you'll see a bright dot. And that's obviously ridiculous, right? Because if I have a light source here, shining light every way, and a spherical, you said? Yeah. A spherical object in its path, and I make a big screen to see the shadow, well, what's going to happen? I mean, some light will just bounce right off the object. But as soon as it gets to the edge, it'll go past smoothly. And, and those points just on the edge will give you the outline of the shadow. Right? You'll see a nice circular shadow with light all around it. But you've made one crucial approximation, which turns out not to be quite true. That if light were a particle, sure, it would just bounce off like that. But if light's a wave, when it hits the edge of the object, it'll instead create a little wave front like this, which can actually leak inside the shadow. But if waves meant that light leaked around shadows, then wouldn't I not cast a shadow? There'd be all the light behind me from the leaky wave? Well, the crucial property of waves is that they can both cancel out and add together. You might know this from noise-canceling headphones. You know, if, if waves are out of sync, they can actually cancel out. And there's something very special about the point right in the center of the shadow is that if you divide the sphere into two hemispheres, each point on the top and the bottom is equidistant from this point over here. So from here to here is the same distance as from here to here. But what does distance have to do with it? I, uh, I mean, this point is some distance from, from everything else. OK, so let's draw a picture of a wave to see how distance manages to get waves to add up in sync. So here's a picture of a wave. It's just some disturbance, some shape which repeats in time. It's got some peaks and it's got some valleys. Yeah, yeah, yeah. OK, so but now if I draw some other wave and give it a head start, I'll start it from here instead of here, but it'll have exactly the same shape. So here it goes up, goes down, goes up, goes down. But notice that wherever the green wave goes up, the white wave goes down. Wherever the green wave is down, the white wave is up. So the total sum of these things just cancels out entirely. So for waves to be in sync, one of them can't have a head start or the other. They have to travel the same distance. They have to start and end at the same place. And that's what's so special about this point right here, that any other point, there would be some other random contributions which cancel out. I mean, maybe. This seems ridiculous to me, though. We should probably just try it and see what happens. Well, luckily, we have the tools to do that in the MIT Junior Lab. So we're going to go set up the experiment now. Let's go. We're now in the MIT Junior Laboratory, where our experiment is all set up and we're ready to go. Remember that we only need two things for this experiment, a light source and a perfectly spherical object for the light to shine on. For our light source, we're using this red laser right here, which is great for us because the beam of the laser is very focused and you can see it reflected on my hand right here. We need that to be about the same size or smaller than the object that we're using to shine on. Now I'm going to turn the laser off right now. I'll turn it back on in just a second. You'll notice that I was wearing safety goggles. It's very important to wear safety goggles whenever you're working with lasers. For our spherical object, we're using this 1 8 of an inch chrome ball bearing. With modern manufacturing techniques, we can get this very close to perfectly spherical, whereas in the original experiment, they had to mold a metal disc from scratch. And, but now we can do considerably better. Now, as hard as I'm trying to hold my hand perfectly still, there's no way I'll be able to keep this exactly still in the path of the beam. So what we've done is found a way to attach the ball bearing to something and keep it steady. We're using a magnetized nail, magnetized using magnets like these. And the fact that the ball bearing is metal means that we can attach it magnetically very carefully to the tip of the nail that you see right there. Now when I turn the beam on, you can see it hit the very front of this ball bearing right here. And the way we were able to get this aligned like this is the one extra ingredient in our setup, which is this device called an iris. And all it does is help us align the beam. Now we're going to see the shadow 
that this setup produces on this white piece of paper here attached to the wall, which is going to act as a screen. You'll notice you don't see anything right now. That's because the lights in the room are far, far brighter than the light coming from the laser. So to see anything at all, we're going to need to turn the lights off. Wow, that's a fascinating pattern formed by the shadow of the ball bearing. Right in the center of that bright spot, that's the Poisson spot. That's what we were looking for, and we found it, just as Poisson's argument predicted. We've pointed it out here with a white arrow, which will now turn off so you can see the spot more clearly. You can also see the shadow of the nail, that triangular point on the left, and that fuzzy black disk in the middle is the shadow of the ball bearing. Remember, if light were just a particle, we would just see that black disk, but we also see the spot in the middle and these interesting patterns of bright and dark rings surrounding the shadow. Where do those come from? Those certainly can't be explained by light behaving like a particle, and so it's even more evidence that light behaves like a wave. We'll now pull the ball bearing out from the path of the laser beam. You can now see the laser beam fully exposed on the screen. And we'll push the ball bearing in very slowly and watch the spot reappear. And there it is. We never see a perfectly dark ring, which we would if light were a particle. We always see this bright spot and the accompanying pattern of light and dark circles. We're back from the lab where we saw the spot in the middle of the shadow. It was pretty clear that there's a spot right there. And no matter how hard we tried, we couldn't get the ball to form just a perfectly dark shadow. Even just the spot in the middle, there's all this other stuff that we saw on the screen, these rings around the shadow that Josh has drawn. It turns out these are also perfectly predicted by the wave properties of light. The one important thing that we didn't mention in the beginning was that we needed a coherent source of light to make this work. We needed all those waves to start out in sync. And actually, that's what the laser did for us. That explains why you don't see this phenomenon in everyday life. It's because it's very hard to get a coherent source of light like that. And it's also very hard to get a perfect sphere. That's true. I mean, I'm not, like, going around me in different ways, you get lots of different distances because I'm not like. Yeah, and even 1% deviation from perfect spheres would make this spot totally disappear. So we had a very careful setup, but we saw it. So I think. That pretty much proves that light's a wave, right? Yeah. I'd say we're done. Light's a wave. 19th century correct. Well, not quite. Because it turns out that in the 20th century, there were other experiments that were done that provided pretty convincing evidence that light was a particle. But that's a story for another time. <laughs> I just want to emphasize that we came to a pretty ridiculous conclusion. But instead of stopping there, we went and did the experiment. And that's really what science is all about. If you think you find something ridiculous, go ahead and test it. You might be surprised. Mr. Burns, would you please cover up the sun? <laughs> I said to the Simpsons. <laughs> There's an episode in which he decides to finally defeat man's greatest enemy, the sun, by installing a giant shield over Springfield. So it's like no matter where you put it, there's just that dot that's just not going away.